have everybody's attention. Uh, I want to introduce our speaker today. This is uh, Dan Fry, who is uh, coming from NASA JSC. And uh, he's also, he's been an adjunct faculty member here at UH Clear Lake for um, several years, and he's taught the, um, uh, the statistical mechanics class, the, st the statistical mechanics and thermodynamics class at the graduate level. And um, he's also, he's been involved in the, uh, the space um, uh, uh, group at JSC, uh, first as a contractor and now as a, a civil servant. So he's here to talk about dealing with extreme uh, space weather events, and I'm going to turn over to Dan. Did you start it recording? Yeah, you ready? it's already recording. All right, okay, thanks. So what I want to do is the following. Um, there's kind of two. I was coming over here. I thought about one minute to share. There's a little bit of self motivation because what I'd like to do is raise the share of the feeling, which you're also going to do. I'll call it your voice. So, at any point in time, while I'm talking, the question is please jump in and stop me and then when I turn on, you have an idea. Share whatever ideas you have because what I want to outline here is that this problem I'm going to show you isn't just the focus of NASA in terms of protecting the crew. And this was probably about a year ago. I went to a, a workshop called out of Virginia called Extreme Space Weather. And there was NASA representation, there was people from DOE, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration has a space weather prediction center. The Midwestern director for FEMA was there. Numerous uh, people from the policy and telecommunications. You might ask, why are all these why are all these people at the workshop? Well, the issue comes up that it's not space weather affects not just the astronauts and the crew on long duration missions or even in Leo, but it affects satellites, it affects the airline going over fights over the poles. Okay? Um, I think this was back in 89, there was one power transform that was affected by a rather severe human storm that took place. And it induced the scenario just like we had lightning, right? There was a coupling and charge and what that thing. Well, when you have a large number of particles coming in and disturbing the human field, that's a lot of current that's up in the upper atmosphere, it's unstable. It induces current on the ground, and that current wants to go somewhere. It just happened that it went to a transform. And pose the particular problem with power grid. One, they're all spaghetti. The power grids are it's just a big issue. That if they're not independent. If one goes out and things to affect the bottom of the grid. But if you knock out a transformer, there are those power transformers that are actually built in the United States. Not one. They're all built in Europe. And they have about a two year lead time that costs about $8 million a year. So, they're naturally interested in the of the problem. Being that most of us, we have a large population density on the northeastern corridor of the United States. And because of the way the geomagnetic field is changes, the northeastern corridor is north. Right? You have a bigger propensity to have effects on the northeastern side, exactly where you don't want it. So there's natural fear about knocking out the power grid for a substantial amount of time during weeks or months. Financial industry is worried about it. All companies are worried about it because where they store their data, they have no access. So this workshop was about bringing all these people together. Galaxy 5 was a telecom, believe a telecommunication satellite that went up. This was probably about eight months ago, eight or nine months ago. Got into a stable orbit, started communicating with it. Think about several weeks after that happened, Sun missed its big chrome mass ejection. And shortly afterwards, Galaxy 5 died. And what they traced it back to is, is and this comes out of the CPMC, the Space Weather Lab of Goddard, seeing this took out the satellite. So now imagine that it's the entire GPS grid, which satellite. It, it could have a big impact. What I'm going to show you, though, is that what I put up here is not just extreme space weather, they're rare events, which is very hard to deal with. It's not like we can go out and measure the weather on a one-minute occasion, you know, 
you want to go look at rainfall, you want to go look at uh, the, the, the pressure ceiling. We just don't have that capability. So what I want to show you is I'm going to walk through some things here. One is what's the issue really in space weather that I want to talk about? Because space weather encompasses a lot of different things. Okay, I'm going to pick one of them. And that one is actually a prime concern to NASA, primarily for the protection of the crew. Then I want to lay out actually how we deal with it now. Where's our current state of operations that we actually can handle when these things happen? And the third thing then is uh, what is it that we actually know? Uh, what knowledge are we going on to try and understand how to deal with these events? I'm going to show you that. Although our knowledge has progressed over the past 10 years dramatically, we're a long way off trying to forecast when these things happen. Okay? So, back on the 6th of March, this wasn't very long ago, right? We had a big, fairly big event. What you see here is an X ray output from the GO satellite system in geopancreas orbit, the same satellite that you get uh, in weather changes, cloud images. On, on the nightly news. Space environment monitor sensors on that instrument that is measuring X ray output. It's also measuring proton output. These are energetic particles. Each one of these represents a different energy channel. This is time. What we saw is we saw a very big X ray flare take place. About three hours later, we started seeing energetic proton counts go up on those. But I want you to notice here the change in magnitude. It's not going up a factor of two, factor of three. What's going up four is magnitude. Ten to the three to ten to the fifth rise in proton levels from one of these not uncommon. This is another event that took place back in January 14, 2000. I mean, you look at the abrupt change. It shot up. And then you see it start to have a transient today. There's a lot of artifacts in here underneath the hood that, that of the, the fundamental physics that's going on is driving this. You see later on, it actually looks like it's decaying and you get another bump. We saw a shock come through. Bump the, bump the elevated proton levels up higher. Let's look at this image. I'm going to play this image. I don't know if I can get it to rotate over and over again. This is SDA. So, for those who are not aware, recently, in the last year, NASA put up a new observation, Solar Dynamics Observatory. It sits out in geosynchronous orbit. Wonderful instrument. I mean, the resolution that we, we can get now in looking at these features on the sun and the cadence we get, they're sending down terabytes of data a day. Okay? So it's giving us a lot of insight. Watch what happens. Look at this region. Look at this. Watch this bump. Boom. You see the wave that came off? Let's play it again. No, it's going to keep rotating. Good. So this instrument, this is, uh, I'm trying to remember that. This is 17.1 nanometers. It's looking at this, the solar disk. Okay? This is called AIA, Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on SDO. When you see it, what you can see, and it's a little hard to see on the screen here, but you see these regions, you'll Monomagnetic field loop, and boom, and now you see the, that shock of the skin come off that side. Okay. So, we're going to come back to this in a minute because you see these bright patches that show up as we go up and increase in solar activity as the year is going to go on now in 2013, 2014. And you see more of these regions come up. Black is colder potentially cooler in terms of the magnetic energy of that. There's a lot of magnetic energy stored in these regions. And I don't know if you can see these loops, but that's the reason they're correlated. It's another thing that hasn't really been looked at. We don't know how to handle it. We know, I mean, the sun is a big ball of plasma, a big ball of gas. So there's, there's processes that happen that propagate through the rest of the solar surface. And it has happened many times that Many, and I have to come back to that. I need to use that word sparingly when I tell you how many events it's had. Is that you'll see an event kick off and it'll start to decay, and before it decays fully, that region pops off again and you get another one. So there's a lot going on here. 
that we're really only beginning to kind of understand about this. And, and I want to make it clear that, that our job at Johnson, what we're doing as a space radiation analysis group, we're not looking at the details of physics as driving these processes in this space. It's not necessarily fundamental research. We're looking at essentially how do we use the understanding we have in order to protect the crew. And we have to start being able to do better than we're doing now. And we're, we're slowly getting there. Yeah? Uh, you said there was a three-hour difference between when the uh, X-ray flare was emitted and when the uh, solar photons went up. Five times, or is that there? No, good question. I'm going I'm to get more into that in a minute. Um, so that so that we don't pass it off and, and at least give you some answers. The big different impact of that region was there. Okay. I'll tell you why in just a minute. Commonly, with the, the, if you look over the ensemble events we've had since like 1986, you'll see a flare go off and in 20 minutes it's just so long. You can't do anything. Pick up the phone and call somebody and say, Claire went off. What do we do? I don't know. Well, how big is it going to be? And this is the questions we always get. How big is it going to be? I don't know. Well, how long is it going to last? I don't know. You weren't doing that situation. You do the best you can, right? And I'll explain a little bit more and a little bit about how, how we handle that currently. So, get into it. How do we deal with it? This way it's going to learn. Pretty much comes down to that. It's what we call now casting. We're not forecasting, we're now casting. Something happens, we're reacting to it. We're doing the best that we can at the time. So we make extensive use of the robotic fleet. So SDO that I showed you, there's SOHO and ACE that are out at those L1 Lagrange points. Those satellites, the two stereo satellites that are actually now around the back side of the sun. Those are our eyes. Those are what's watching what's going on in real time and streaming that information back so we can maintain situational awareness. It is limiting the hop. You have to react. Okay? So if something happens and you're, you're communicating with like the control team and you're going, okay, so what do I tell the crew? What do I tell the surgeon? Do I tell them they need to deorbit and come back home? I hope not. That's Quite costly and quite risky. I'm going to do that all of a sudden. For the most part, as I noted here, this is a problem in Leo that we can kind of handle with situational awareness. It would be better if we could forecast. But in Leo, you got to keep in mind that you make one revolution every nine minutes. Okay? If you think about, I don't have a picture of this chart. Again, that guy a little bit off camp here. So if you think about it as a dipole, you know that you're going to get a lot of particles that stream in on these field lines at the poles. Okay? You get much less trying to come across the equator. The, the dipole field extends way out. And you have a very big moment arm to kind of kick these particles out of the way. Right? You're making a rev, and what happens is F2 passes, okay, um, primarily over, over North America, and then when you swing back down past the horn of, of South Africa, those regions are particularly dangerous in terms of the way the geomagnetic field is structured. You get a lot more particle penetration in those regions. Mm -hmm. So then how do you deal with it? Well, you look where the thrust media is, and you watch it, and you see when it's going through those regions. You know the approximate amount of time there. So then you're trying to advise, you think that the exposure would be high enough to warrant them going to another location. That's we work in real time. When that event kicked off, we had console operators that were recalled back to mission control. And that event, I think, we go back. I don't know, I lost the scale here. This event stayed up. This event didn't come down until out here. Probably near about five or six days that someone was on console 24 Monitoring, advising the surgeons. Okay. Um, 
as you might suspect, and that is the case, is that in these regions, you get the most dose. As it starts to decay, you get less. So you're taking that into account in real time as well. We're monitoring uh, Just to point out here, these energy channels, this goes from low energy to high energy. This is greater than one energy proton, all the way down to greater than 100 energy. Now, this instrument has higher channels. I don't have them plotted here, but it will measure up to five, greater than 500 meters. But photon from solar photon event, that's essentially the name for it. You'll hear people say solar photon event, solar energetic photon event. They're kind of used anonymously, kind of this loop to fall um, But you know, anywhere from 10, 10 MeV up to a G in energy. And I'll show you some spectra here in a few minutes to get a feel for that. So they're penetrating. When you start getting 10 for the NEV, you start worrying about that. And you see those channels go up. This is the 10th. Okay? This is the third. Definitely all the stuff above that energy is going to come barreling through. So the other way we can deal with this forecast, like I said, we know more now, but we don't know enough. Um, First principles model, I'll give you an example. So, I forget the author of the book, uh, but it's called Space Weather. And it shows a nice plot in there of the trend of, of forecasting of lower pressure sailing above North America. It's somewhere around, I don't remember, 1940 ish for the current day. And you see the skill score. The skill score is just a metric that's telling you how good the forecasting model is doing. Typical skill scores will reference zero as random prediction. Nothing better than what's going to cost. One is perfect. You get it right all the time. Okay. So if you watch, if you look at the trend in skill score over time, you see this gradual kind of climb up. Current day, that skill score is about 0 0.99. In 1940, it started out at about 0 0.3. The best space weather model we have that gives us a forecast is from the Space Weather Prediction Center. It gives you a one hour lead time at most, and it has a skill score of 0.4, and a false alarm rate of 50%. Forecast up to the top. It just throws another piece of the puzzle there of things you have to deal with and ops. Do you want a high false alarm rate? Well, it depends. To cruise out on an EBA, maybe you do. Okay? If it's something definitely critical, right? This could be pose a risk to, to you know, life, liberty, and, pro and prosperity. Maybe you want a high false alarm rate. But in other times, you don't because you're, you're, you're modifying activities and you don't need to. So those, those types of things come into play, but that's, that's currently where we sit. And that's not a slight on Swift. It's just that Mother Nature isn't helping us out here. It's doing what it does. The fun's doing what it does, and we're just trying to learn that. So most in-development models, even what the Space Weather Prediction Center does, or what I call just essentially making use of empirical correlation. They look at something like a flare, and maybe you take the peak out of that flare, and you try to correlate it to when you saw an event. The difficulty when you start looking at all this data is that you very quickly realize that the number of flares you have far outseeds any number of solar protons that you have. So you naturally expect you're going to have a large of high flux one rate. Because a lot of times you get flares pop off, boom, 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 and nothing. You don't have seen any energetic cosine. So it's not the best correlator, but it's, it's the best we have right now. So I want to show you. I mean, let's go one more slide first. So what do we know? So what I've plotted over here is this comes from solar uh, space weather prediction center. What you're seeing here is sunspot number, and this is. Uh, this is year from, uh, let's see, this is January 2000 
to those one, two, three, all the way out to January 2019. This is the 10.7 centimeter radial plug with the same horizontal axis. So what you're seeing here is back in 2000, 2001, 2002, we probably were still there. Some button number was kind of high. I'm right, just pointed out those regions, those bright regions. Those are groups of sun spots. So that's, that's essentially a, a, a surrogate that tells us something about the solar activity. When the disk is spotless, good. Yeah, it's, it's not the energy partition in there that's going to produce some events. When we have a high number of sun spots, we typically see events in this time period. See, it came out of that, 09, we had a long minimum, now we're coming back up. Fall. You see the same trend with the radio flow. That when you're at high solar, large, larger number of a higher frequency of solar photon events, the radio flux goes up. Okay. Interestingly, when this is high, the galactic cosmic radiation is at a The general thought on that is that what's driving this is changes in the solar magnetic field. When we have higher solar activity, it tends to actually, the solar magnetic field tends to filter out some of the GCR. So you see the GCR go down faster to power factor. Okay. So, how do we use this information? Uh, I just realized that I left the same text on the solar system as one So, these sunspot groups, they're typically called active regions, within the community, ARs. These regions are thought to be precursor of where the universe is. If you can understand what's going on in an active region, you can understand how the energy is stored, you can understand how the energy is released, then you can understand something about when an event is going to kick off. Perhaps something about maybe how big the event is going to be. But we don't know yet. A um, couple methods of use with that. So what you saw on the video was EUV. Magnetogram imagery. Magnetogram imagery is looking at the iron signature. So remember Zeeman splitting? The magnetic field is actually splitting the energy levels in iron. We can image that. The magnetogram then gives us information in terms of what the polarity distribution of the magnetic field in that region is. Okay? We can watch that in real time. We can watch that with SDO on a cadence. I forget, I think it's every 96 seconds it takes another snapshot. Helio site, um, the gong suite that is actually ground based, stands for Global Oscillation Network Group. Okay, this is that suite has the capability to look at these regions that actually look at just like you would think of seismology, look at how waves are actually penetrating, so you can look at things as they evolve around the disk. Okay, and you can look at depth through the photosphere through the corona. Characteristics, size, number of spots, skin line complexity, prior activity, all of these essentially are, are what are thought to be measures of the stored magnetic energy. What we see is that if we have spots, we have active reasoning with a very small number of spots. What I mean by spots is separation in the magnetic polarity. Okay? You can think about it as you know, if you thought about just simply two magnets, right, you would connect north and south. Well, really what you have is, is you can have that are like this, they're kind of oblong shaped. You can have many regions and they, they, these all might join. They might have some complex pattern in here where the magnetic field lines get twisted. Okay? When they do that, the general concept is it's unstable. And wants to go somewhere. We're still just kind of learning about this. So, like I said, a spotless disk, essentially no work. And that's the, those, this, there's more detail kind of summarizing the overall state of kind of what we know. But in terms of trying to glean information out of the physics, the research that's going on to make it applicable to forecasting. Right now, we're kind of left, left with this. And we have a lot of data on this over the past decade. 
The issue is pulling that information out. So you asked the question about what's the difference on one side or the other. What I show up here is I just drew a, a pic, took one of the images. That was actually off the Soho. Each one of those dots represents the location of an active region that was identified to have produced a solar photon event between 1986 and 2006, 2009. And I think you can see where most of them come from. Most of them seem to come from more, more Western Hemisphere. Right? These regions on rotate this way. So what you watch, what you see is regions progress across the same distance. We see most of the regions seem to pop up here. You see more, you see a few over here, but there's definitely more of them here. This is nothing more of a histogram of just the number of events based on this is southern hemisphere. Then I broke down east and west. Southeastern, southwestern, and so forth. So it looks like between southwestern and northwestern, they're about the same. You get about an even spread other than north and south. Okay? And that matches essentially trends that we see in some spots as, they, as you go solar cycle to solar cycle. What you see up here, this was a model run that was done at the Community Coordinated Modeling Center out in Goddard, the Space Weather Lab. Model one is called envelope. The purpose of this is actually what you see in X and Y in astronomical units. This is the sun at the center. This is a map, I believe, of, and it's hard to show on here, but they have other planets designated as well. This is essentially a, a interplanetary magnetic field map. So you picture the, 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 the sun is. Uh, inside about 15 to 20 solar radii, the magnetic field kind of looks toward oil. Once you get outside of that, the solar wind actually is pulling them and extending the magnetic, magnetic, solar magnetic field and carrying it out into the planetary space. But the sun's rotating at the same time. So what you get is what's called the Parker's problem. Okay. So if you get an event here on this side, Think back about this picture. If you get an event on this side of the disk, and Earth is actually positioned here, the magnetic connectivity or the mapping of that part of spiral back to Earth is weak. On the western hemisphere, what it happens, and you get a large degree of magnetic connectivity. So what happens is you get particles that will come off the Parker spiral. This is very, it's definitely more complex than this. But this is just a, a very simple conceptual picture of what's going on. You tend to get particles and they want to travel the field line. And so they come promptly. Okay? It doesn't explain the number of events. It explains the time delay that we see. Typically on the east side event, particles have to diffuse across the Parker spiral, the interplanetary magnetic field, and the diffusion takes some time. But from the western side, they get here faster because they don't have to undergo all that diffusion. Okay. Follow me? Is that an answer? So these are the three questions I've listed at the top that really are the ones that we're interested in. When's it going to happen? How big is it going to be? How long is it going to last? Really can narrow it down to three questions. So what I've defined here is what we would like to be able to do and what we think we can do with the current state of the information we have, the current state of knowledge. Okay. When we'd like to be able to forecast. Okay. We'd like to be able to forecast it probably at least about a day after. We'd like to have a forecasting window of 24 hours. Okay. How big? Okay. Well, we'd like to be able to forecast that, but we have a historical archive of events, so we might be able to use, we might be able to address that by statistical analysis. Okay. The pink lines there are essentially things that are hidden. We're not sure exactly how to do that. 
How long? We might be able to address like this. We like to take a look at But that's going to be much more difficult. So, here too is actually this box here is essentially taking a historical record of events to try to see how the characteristics of what's going on. How big are they? The ones we're seeing, how long will it last? And is there a way that you actually could do the same type of analysis, very rudimentary, but somewhere to get you one step closer to being able to know when? Now, I think by when is you have to be careful how you specify that. So if you're if you're going out on a mission, your mission is going to be six months. You'd like to know there's many ways you can fly site that. Do you want to know if you're going to have one event in the next six months, or one event in the next one month, five events in the next six months? Or maybe you want to know if you're going to exceed a given particle flux or a given dose. How you classify the problem is going to affect how much information we're going to be able to glean from that. And so we have to ask the question carefully. So a list here just that are important to us um, and also are important for what I'm going to get to in just a second. Notice that I've got maximum, maximum daily flux, maximum cumulative flux, maximum daily dose, maximum cumulative dose, maximum dose rate. So maybe we can't predict or forecast what it'll be for a given event, but maybe we could at least predict that it won't be any bigger than a certain threshold. And that's still valuable operation, to, valuable information to ops. So here's the general picture. Total time of elevated proton level, about 4% of the time span between 1986 and now. 4% of the time is really elevated up. Okay. Events occur randomly. We don't see any signature that they actually have to do other than they seem to occur more frequently the time span between 3.5 years before solar mass and four years after. In that time span of 7.5 years, they seem to go off the map. Events are rare, which is hard. The data set is sparse. Okay? A small fraction then of those events that have to are also considered extreme. They have a four to five change, a four to five order of magnitude change in the, in the intensity of the radiation level in particle flux over the rest of the event. Uh, we don't know the exact physical mechanism that drives them. Historical observations are rather incomplete in that we have a lot of data, but they come from different platforms, they come from different satellites, and different orbits. The EIT and magnetic structure, so all those details in that, in that details in those regions, we actually only have data since 1996. We get scale back and not correlate to that, the number of events we have more. Um, does any of this, in terms of the rarity and the extreme nature, sound like anything else in this kind of Earthquakes? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Hurricanes. Financial market collapse. Housing market collapse. Doesn't happen often. What happens is typically big. Right? 100 year flood. What I'm driving at is if we can find correlation in the behavior of this data set to other fields, we might be able to leverage some of those things. Yes? Uh, what is, what's the background? The background proton level point one. So, so what constitutes uh, elevated sigma above that or good question. So this is where it gets a little bit trickier. Notice all of these here, you can see this is just background fluctuation. Okay. This is down to about point one to maybe point zero two. Look at these. What happened with this event? Was before we had this fire, there was another coronal mass ejection. 
clock thickens even more. It's not a chrome line projection. It doesn't look like it. You can have a CME and no energy in photon. Think about the, the general picture you can have in the head. Is no one needs, and I wish I would have brought one, but these uh, high speed photography of what like water or, or something or any explosion. You generally see when 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 it, when it strikes, you'll see big chunks of stuff come off kind of slowly, but then there's you can tell there's this pressure wave that expands out much faster. That pressure wave is analogous to these energetic photons. The CME is the chunk. The CME is traveling at about a big CME is probably 1,500 kilometers per second. And take probably about 24 hours or so to get here. So that energy level is on the order of 10 to the These are particles traveling at 10 to the So these guys get here much faster. But what happened was is that the interplanetary space, I think, was seeded with ions that were of lower energy. And so it bumped up. It took some time, but it bumped up these background level energy. Okay? And as the CME came through and there was a shock wave, it seemed like it compressed it and it bumped the energy up. And then you had a flare and it kicked off this energetic release. And so you see the blue crop line, the background is higher and then it bumped up. Generally, when we look at background levels, so in that 4%, and I think that's what you're maybe coming to, the 4% is referencing these background levels. Not where we have a CME, okay? Or they, we had elevation. Typically, they're around about 0.1 TFU, which is 0.1 photon per square centimeter per second. Uh, and that's simply the threshold of the instrument. It's just reading whatever it holds. Um, so when you see the same type of thing here, when these came back down the background, this is can't start to see that this is all So that's in reference. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and in the second part of the question was uh, elevated is, is so the way I defined elevated there was the 10 NEV photons, so this last line here, and this is this is a threshold that if anyone can go to NOAA's website, the Space Weather Prediction Center, and you can sign up for their alerts and warnings. Okay, when they when when they kick out an alert, you'll get an email. It tells you what the conditions are. It's a service that they provide to whoever you want. We use those, those thresholds, and what we, what we trigger off of is one of the first triggers is this greater than 10 NEV proton when it crosses 10 TFU, or 10 protons per square centimeter per second. So, what I call elevated in that number that I gave you, because it triggers us operationally to take note, is when the 10 went over 10 and came back down. That makes sense. So that that determined for us the critical time we had to be paying attention. Sense the CFU threshold and then they decayed back down again. That was elevated time. Everything else was not elevated time. So looking at from 1986 forward, if you take all those times into account, four percent of that total time period we were elevated based on that threshold criteria. So this is not to be meant to be completely complete, but I think it's important whenever you're discussing work and you're discussing what's been done, uh, we don't work in a vacuum. So some of the things I'm going to share with you in terms of statistical analysis, some of these ideas have been generated in other places with different applications. Um, the work with Simon and the work of my Zapsos group, who we're actually working with now, um, focused on robotic missions. The issue there is robotic missions have lifetimes of maybe 10 years. We're not sending a human out for 10 years. It's not now. Maybe one day. And so the, the, the data can all data was on. We want to be able to look at weeks and months and also about year of mission time. Um, Frank Uchinata, who well, Frank is actually the lead of the space radiation biology over at NASA. Um, they've looked at this in terms of another way to look at probabilistic modeling. There's some, some nice things about this analysis. Um, we have some questions on 
you know, focus seems to be the 30 MeV proton torque. We actually wanted to come back from that and say, well, can we do this for the entire proton spectrum, which I'll show you in a minute. That means all the energy channels I showed you, not just one channel. Um, so a lot of this is really nice work, and we took this then and tried to build off of these techniques to go back and address it for human missions. Um, so here's kind of what it boils down to. What you see at the top is an expression for the dose. Now this is, I'm going to be careful here, this is one expression. This is dose essentially coming from what's called electronic energy deposition. So it's not a nucleus colliding with a nucleus. Okay, but the take home from this is that you see two terms. This is the electron stopping power. Okay, that's really encapsulating the underlying physics of how one proton is interacting with the constituents in that whether it's water, aluminum, polyethylene, whatever, okay? This is pretty well understood. I mean, this has been, stopping power measurements have been made for decades. Okay, we understand that pretty well. C of E is the flux. This is the amount of stuff that's coming at you from a solar proton. All the energetic protons that have been thrown away towards Ultimately, in this situation, it will be the crew. That part of it's not well understood. The spectral shape, the intensity, the time profile. Those are the things that we want to understand because if we can understand that from a photon event, then we can try to correlate that back to what the dose is and the temporal profile of exposure. So the end point of interest here really is food mission risk, building the design, mission planning, and ultimately forecasting. Okay? So everything that I'm going to talk about, really, from here on out, deals with that. Trying to pull out the properties of that for event, some characteristic. And I'm running back, running a little back here, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. I know it's, I know it's late. Um, so how do we approach this? Well, there's there's a whole slew of statistical techniques. Here. There's countless examples of this. A couple of the ones we pulled out had to do with how the data was already available. Okay, we can get flux as a function of time, and we can integrate over these events. What I mean by that is that if you have, if you looked at the time profile of the flux as a function of time, you see the flux go up and come back down. If that's our threshold, this is event, and we're the event, and we're simply adding up the flux for each one of those energy channels. If you do it for each energy channel. You plot flux as a function of energy, and you get a spectrum. That spectrum is what you need for a dose calculation. Okay, that's the connection there. You can turn these things into what is called ability distributions. So you want to start looking at a given confidence level. What is the likely spectral shape that you'll get for a given mission to Extreme value analysis. Back to what I mentioned when you said about earthquakes. This isn't just for extreme events. They use, uh, engineers use this for reliability analysis, to look at fault tolerance when things are going to fail. But this, this is a very powerful technique. Okay. So we're going to exploit that a bit here. One of the things I want to point out that I think is, 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 is to me, is the most important in dealing with small data sets and trying to pull information out of it is that you have to quantify what you mean by statistical significance. We're all best for all. You cannot talk about, in terms of, have a few events to talk about the characteristics. It has no meaning. You have two events in 20 years. The concept of usual on statistical significance is quite so we have to be a little bit careful there. Um, I'm going to skip that and that. So this is one thing that we did. We built an interface. So you know, you go back, you go back to 1986 when it goes. There's another satellite called Kim that moved back to 1963. It was in a very elliptical orbit. Every robotic mission essentially that goes up, there's some standard in the data in terms of formal, but not across. So unless you want to sit there and you want to park, 
15,000 X files of data going into a cell. And it's all, you know, um, you, have to, you have to use all the means. So we went back to the open source and put it all in our mind. Twice a script, put whatever threshold we want, twice, twice a day. The database we have now, I think, has something like uh, 15 million records. Now I can parse it and produce 90 uh, spectra in about five seconds. So you have to make use of the techniques available to you, the resources to try and speed this up, or else you will spend 10 years instead of developing forecasting or uh, probability curves, you'll develop expertise in Excel about where it goes. Um, I'm going to skip that one. So this is the drive home. In fact, that it looks like the random. So what I did here was I took the database that I just showed you, and we looked at the events that start each event. Simply what you do is you look at the time between events. Okay, so one event kicked off and ended. Sometimes later, we have another method for that. We can look at the beginning, the, the, the statistical distribution of those time differences between one event, two events, three events, and so forth. So, what I plot between events and days, and this is nothing more than a histogram. What it fits with, and this is actually looking at the time event between one event and the next one that comes. So, I didn't go, in other words, the zero for them. The first order, right, looks like it's 400. So that first order, that's what I fit this curve with. We know the zeroth order term is, is called the waiting time until the event. There's no memory associated with that. Okay? distribution of the law of rare events. So it looks to be that event, you have an event, and you're looking at what's the probability of some waiting time that's distributed. Um, we could go into further studies of this by taking out more terms in the distribution, but we didn't at this point because we were simply looking at it. We wanted to know what the random occurrence, whether it was randomly occurred between one event and the next, not one event and the next three. Okay. So that was, and this has been found, the, uh, John Feynman they saw similar things looking at the imp data. Not the GOES data, but they analyzed the imp, which was earlier, and they found a similar type of distribution. So what you see here, remember I mentioned the integrating these, these spectra up. So if I actually integrate each one of those time-dependent curves, Eventually, I get, for each one of those energy channels, I get a spectrum. That's what you see here. These are events integrated proton fluent. In part protons per square centimeter, there's a proton in an energy in any These are classified as some of the worst in historical records. The 1972 event, which happens to be, in many cases, or has been a design standard for shielding on vehicles. You also see the Halloween 1989 storm, right? which I think pushed the Aurora down to somewhere like Ohio. It's quite strong. So what you see here is various fitting techniques for this energy. Now what we wanted to do was it said, said well, okay, hold on that. So if we base everything we're going to look at in terms of protecting the crew, the probability that they're going to see some flux, the probability they're going to see some dose. If you fix it to these absolute worst case scenarios, you're neglecting the entire rest of the distribution. A couple problems with that. One, it's severely constrained. And two, maybe you don't have the right event. So said so this, let's not go this. Actually, cast this looking at it statistically. And that's what you see here. So what we did was do the same thing, event integrated funds, but we're simply using this ranking statistic to, to pull out what would be a percentile spectrum. Okay? So what you see here is various percentile spectrum from 95th down to 25th. 
smooth curve here. And this is, again, this is a double power loss that we expected. So what we can do is, and if you look at this, so the interesting thing was is the red curve is that 1972 event, okay? And this was a pit. The, the circles of the event. Um, the triangles are the 95th percentile pulled out of the whole distribution. Okay? The green is the 89th So what we saw from this is instead of the high energy tail, the 95th percentile, the primary contribution to it is the Okay. You, don't have, you understand what I mean by 95th percentile? It means 95 percent of the events have a flux of that energy lower than this curve. But the King event shows more interesting behavior. Now we don't have data out here, but you see that the King event at the lower energy, like between 10 and 100, actually is above the 95th percentile. Okay, and so. Now you get into a trade-off when you start looking at what exposure the screw would get, because the exposure they get is very dependent on the spectrum that you're actually throwing out. Because the path is shielded the material to examine the radiation. How much gets through? How much goes to the bottom? Once the shield is thick, it's thick. Okay? So we still decided that probably going with 95% is the best. Um, because of time, I'm going to move a little bit faster here. What time did we start? Um, it was like 10 after? after. Okay. So let me show you this. So another way that you can look at this is, we decided, we said, okay, look, what's the fundamental question we're trying to ask? I mean, we had, um, I believe, 96 events we identified between 86 and the current time. So what would we like to know? Well, we'd like to know what's the probability that the flux maybe would exceed a certain value at the end Over a given mission duration, the mission duration is two weeks a month of work. If we can determine that, we can actually at least set a threshold that says, well, at a given confidence level, we don't expect it what, and hence the dose to exceed this value over the next month. That gives us a much more much more grounded footing in trying to advise the flight control team. And for us to be able to say now, I don't know, I don't know how big it's going to be. It gives us a number to be able to quantify that. So the first step in kind of doing that is you have to determine what is the likely spectral shape going to be based on the confidence level that you select. So you go through the data and you start looking at cumulative probability. And you have to do this carefully. You have to do it for every energy channel because you're trying to form a spectra out of this. You don't, not just one energy point. So what you see here is going from one MEV all the way down to greater than 500 points. The distribution of event integrated flux, by and large, looks more normal. Okay. It looks more normal, at least down to cumulative probability, is probably about 16. The issue, the reason you see this jump, this data is taken with one instrument on the ghost satellite. This data is taken with another on the ghost satellite. But it just so happens that when the event of the events we had, there were some events that this instrument in other words, the higher energy channels never kicked up. So essentially the spectrum, from what we can tell, looks like this. Okay. So there's down to a certain cumulative probability, which is based really on the number of events where we saw no rock in these energy channels. Okay. So essentially can't use that. We know that the background will identify, but we can use from about 0.6 all the way up to, I don't know, 0.95 cumulative probability. Because we know what the functional form is, we can use that then to do Monte Carlo things. Because we can sample a lot of normal distribution easily. 
there's still one big problem with it that we're, we're, we're still trying to work out. It's not quite that simple. Because if you go to sample a hog normal on this, you have to be careful when you do it. It comes back to what the shape looks like. Right? I mean, the flux at this energy level is somewhat correlated to the flux at this energy level. It's a continuous function. So if you, if you sample these independently of one another, each with their own log normal, you might get a spectral shape that's completely unphysical. So you have to do Monte Carlo sampling, but in a way that correlates the energy. There's some ways to do this, but we're still trying to kind of work that out. It's a little bit tricky. Okay. I'm going to show you one example of this maximum entropy theory, and then one plot on a correlation we've found, and then we'll call it, I'm going to end there. So maximum entropy theory essentially is looking at, ultimately, it's the energy, the information, how much nitrogen. So if you cast this in terms of the information content you have in the distribution of data, right, it's essentially the law of of the flux at each energy channel. You're now set out to define the entropy just like you would with the form of S. Minus the set of the sum of the interval of C log C. And you're now setting out to minimize it. So when you actually go through that procedure, you minimize this by the method of Lagrange multiplier, you get a probability distribution. So now you can go back and ask the question. I've got my database. I've got each one of the, the flux values. Now you, you have to characterize it in a certain way. So you want to characterize the flux as the event integrated flux, the peak flux, the basic flux, the flux of the first four hours of the event. They all make a difference. And they make a difference in characterizing the impact of the mission. Because if you characterize it as the event flux accumulated over one year, but you want a probability over a mission extending down to one month, it won't work. Because you've lost all that, you've averaged out all that information, you don't have it anymore. So you have to subdivide your data appropriately. But what that do now is the parse this. Once you've, once you've selected what you want to be to represent, what time interval you're integrating with, you simply call the database and you're counting the number of events that exceeded a given flux. Okay? The number of events in the flux satisfying that the log of C is greater than the zero has to be proportional to one minus C of the probability. When you do that, okay, you're able to come out with an expression like this. And actually, you're able to, you can, you can show, show these are these ones, that you can actually put time in because it becomes now a double exponential. Here's your time, here's your potential. And that's why I was harping on the fact that the way you grid the flux during time period, you have to integrate over a time period that at least that's less than or equal to the mission duration you want. Or else you're going to wipe out all the information you add in that statistical set. And I'm going to show actually that one. And this is what you get. The probability of it being an event integrated flow versus an event integrated flow for each one of the energy channels. And what you see is that what, what happens is Probabilities in this region, this is dominated by events that are rough, that are what I can call consider small. In other words, the, the event integrated flux wasn't that big. This is dominated by the rare extreme events because the integrated flux is high. And you see you have a threshold, it looks like they're approaching the asteroid. However, the probability of exceeding this flux is proportional to the time one minus the time based on the theory that I outlined. So what you do here is you pick a confidence level you want, and then you draw a line. Each one of these crossings gives you a spectrum. 
in that spectrum, you can turn around and run some radiation type of course. So now you can characterize over a given mission duration. Notice this was taken for six months. So you have a different set of curves for different mission durations. But now for that mission duration, you can characterize what's the maximum from the historical record, what's the maximum level of, of, of dose you would expect to see from an event. Or multiple events. It's not limited to one. It's over that mission duration. And this was just some other examples I had. But one. I want to get to one other thing. So this is just another example of a simple 1D correlation that we teased out that although physically not terribly interesting, but operationally useful. So that's just a distinction I've struggled with from time to time, making that distinction. Operation and skills and stuff is really not to be However, what I've plotted here is the law of, this is, this is a plot of event size. So what I've plotted is uh, <coughs> this event integrated flux versus the peak flux. Okay? So the event integrated flux is the area here versus the peak value. And clearly there's something there. If you calculate the correlation coefficient for this, you're getting numbers that are like 0.9, 0.96. Okay. But clearly there's some correlation there. Okay. So what's the benefit for us for us? Well, this time from event onset to peak, it varies, but it's on the order of, of ten hours. Uh, it can be twelve hours, sometimes it's six hours, versus a week that an event might last. So I can give a heads up within the first 10 hours of an event and what the total spectrum will look like. That's valuable time gain for the flight control team because they don't have to wait until the event concludes at the end. So what you can do is, is you can say, well, I'm going to track because you can fit this, right? It's just a linear regression represented it here. You can track on every five minute interval that the GOES data comes in, you can go back and recalculate what the event integrated prediction will be. And you're constantly. When you get to the peak flux, you see that it actually converges pretty well. So what I've plotted here, so this is the predicted event integrated proton flux based on this relation. And this is the observed event integrated proton flux. So every dot was exactly on that line, it would be a one-to-one. -one. The predicted was exactly what we could do. But there's some scatter. Okay? What I've shown here is just another picture here of um, the, the event integrated flux. It's not supposed to say peak, it's supposed to say event integrated versus event number. So each one of the events in the database, I actually show, I believe the blue actually is the the actual and the, and the magenta is the event, is the predicted. So you can kind of see it doesn't do too bad as well. So that's kind of how, you, how we start teasing out some of these correlations. Um, they're very simple. They're parsing massive amounts of data. That's it. You're trying to pull information as best as you can out of um, So I'm going to. It's very, very late. I'm going to show you, I, I do want to show you one other thing. And this is something that we're still, we're trying to figure out here. Um, Remember I said about some active reasons? So you can track the sun spot number. You can track their aerial size on the disk. Magnetic complexity, how magnetically complex the spot is. You can track that in time. So, what we noticed was, if you go back and you look at all of the uh, active regions that produced an event, 75% of them actually occurred uh, where the onset occurred one to 10 days after this metric hit a map and started to decay. I don't know why. 
talked to a colleague of mine who actually worked in terrestrial weather for a while, and he said, you know, it reminds him of when tornadoes form. And I forget the metric that he, he, he characterized. He said, you see this effect where things start to collapse, right? Right as the tornadoes start to, to, to spring up. And so, to me, this seems to imply that there's some under, underlying physical process. So this was maximum area. So if you look at the area of the region on the visible disk in millionths of a disk, it looks like what happens is it grows and then it starts to collapse. Seventy-five percent of the time, it starts to collapse, and then it takes it down. So the thought was, is well, if that's true, ten days. If you could get one to ten days lead time, if something's going to go off, that would be great. The difficulty is, we had what 96 events from 86. I bet we had 20,000 regions that evolved during that same time period. So, what I want to stress is that although we can pull out simple 1D correlations here, really probably what's going to get us closer to the home plate is we've got to do this in probably multiple dimensions. We've got to link things together in terms of the maybe basing statistics. I don't know. But these are just some of the ideas that we've been kind of tossing around. So I'm going to end this because I think the most important thing is to first be a skeptic. And almost everything I showed here was based off of statistics. Some of these quotes to me just are absolutely amazing. And I just Experiment needs to be fixed. Let's go to experiment. <laughs> so, to me, the take home for this was that we can use all these tools, and it's good because it's, it's all we have. It's the best we have at this point. But we always have to be questioning still what the value is that, that those tools are telling, and be careful to question that continuously. Any questions? Any ideas? Uh, yeah? I don't have an idea. I was just trying to grasp the concept of maximum entropy here. Yeah? Um, can you, I guess, elaborate more on the, what, what that means? Uh, I mean, in a general sense, can you use uh, another field? Yeah. So, for example, I mean, this is primarily for the test. Uh, right, there are several ways that you can look at this. So, just from a straight statistical mechanics point of view, right, you can let, you know, this is minus KD um, times the log of the number of states. I mean, both will change. So it's how you classify this ultimately, right? If you look back, there's an analogy also to information theory. Information theory will characterize an informational entropy in very much the same way. But it comes actually from, I believe, Boltzmann's H theorem. It's also right this is the probability times the log of the probability. So the question is. What is the probability in this case? Now, there's nothing to say, particularly, that we actually pick the right definition. Maybe there's an alternate definition that we could have used that is better. I don't know. But this is this is the definition. This actually, most of this derivation all come, also comes from there's a book by E.J. Gumbel. That I believe is called extreme value theory. It's written back in 1956. And there's three different classes of extreme value probability distributions that he identified that fit a whole class of problems. This is one. I forget, I don't remember the class one or three. So ultimately, what you're doing is you're taking, you're defining now a probability, okay? The same way you would define a probability. Statistical mechanics, we're defining a probability as the log of the flux. 
And what you're saying is the most probable distribution that you can find is the extreme value distribution that maximizes the interest. That's, that's the whole premise here. So that's why, you know, and Gumbel talks about this in his book, that's why it works so well for, for things like failure analysis and things, because they're, ran, they're rare extreme events. You're picking off, you're maximizing the entropy, and you're finding the distribution really that hits the scale of that. Really addresses where the rare extreme events are. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Have you seen earlier that there's not really all parts of the Is there a percentage of extra players that have coincidence with FDE? Yeah, I, I, you know what? I should have added that. I'll, I, let, me, let me see here real quick. I had a backup slide, and I don't remember if I had that in there or not. Um, well, here. So this is actually a, a, just a characterization of what we have in the database. So this is looking at, I mentioned like 96 events, the total number of events, and then I characterized them in terms of which were which were multiple, the total number where you support the case back down the threshold it pops up again. So there's actually multiple, double, triple, we actually had quadruple events. Um, but if you look down here, of all the events in the database, this is the number of C class players, M class players, and X class players. So clearly, X is dominant over C class. The, the class here that determines the peak intensity of the X ray star. X is the highest in the classification. Okay. By and far, what we see is M class and X class are, are the dominant. They usually signify that something else. Uh, if you look at the numbers here, so they're at 10, 20, 30, that's like 42, and then you're getting at 45% of the whole of them. But so that's 42 X class and the M class there are like 25. But from 86 forward, oh geez. I know we've had thousands of X class. So, see, and that's, that's another problem at the end. Is there's a lot, of, a lot of things that happen that we monitor, and that we see a correlation. There's a correlation here that X, seems, X and M signify that something's coming. But when it happens more times, you actually get some, that something coming. It's very hard to use it for this. Is your false alarm rate would be 90 percent? So, so there's been no, is there a correlation between the maximum X-ray fluence and the increase in proton density in Leo? So, what the Swifty, and, and you can go, if you search Chris Bulch, B-A-L-T-H, um, I think in 2008 was the last paper he published on verification of their model. Their model simply states, um, if you, if you think about that in terms of the X-ray flare goes off and comes back down, their model takes the peak, the full width half maximum, and the integrated power, because that's in, in watts uh, per square meter. And these three things, they found a correlation to an event, meaning the 10, I believe the 10 MeV protons went over threshold, the 10 PFU. And that, very much like some of the scatter plots I've shown, there's a lot, you, know, you can draw a line through it, but there's a lot of scatter, right? There seems to be a trend. It has a skill score of 0.4 and a pulse long rate of 0.45, 45%. So and that's it most, keep in mind, and like I said, so on the east side, we saw that east side of that one six. We saw an X-ray flare go off, and about three hours later, we saw both on the threshold. Typically, it's 10 percent. So that's the best we can do to say something's coming, but it doesn't give us the lead time to me. If we go, once we go outside of Leo, 
impact goes up at least all of them. The geomagnetic field is field on the block. You won't have that on the home people who are just going to go to a different location. You have, you have to actively factor those scenarios in. So if we can, if we had a day's lead time, or even if we had four hours lead time, we could do a lot more. So right now you're left more with trying to build shielding into the vehicle, which is it just increases the amount. Any other one question? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go. Uh, and for anyone, I mean, if you got, think about this. It's all about my idea. Just email me. I mean, I don't know. Well, uh, it's kind of random. We need a. We need a. Well, I, yeah. The least. The best thing to probably come from outlandish ideas. So <laughs> go ahead. We need a collection of sacrificial micro satellites in tight orbit around the sun. And uh, we know the location at all times. When uh, one of them dies, uh, we'll have an indication that uh, it was hit by something. Well, you bring up you bring up an interesting point in that I'll put a little different spin on it. So um, think about the backside. So right now, I'll give you an example. So this region that March 6th that popped off was region 1429. That was the region. So it went it rotated off the western edge. Stereo picked it up on the back side of stereo. And it's been active as all can be. It's not showing any signs of the decay. It's just rotating on the back side. The next probably day or two, it's going to rotate back to the desert. And we're going to probably start this whole scenario over again. And you see that, that you'll see regions that rotate around the front side. They'll pop up and they'll go around the back and they'll come back around again. So, you've got to take your scenario, and this is something that has been um, proposed specifically because now that stereo, you know, when stereo got out to, you know, stereo started A and B, head and forward, started out on, uh, on opposite sides essentially of the Earth, right? rotated out 180 degrees and when they got to 180 degrees it was the first time we actually had a full disc view of the sun right so now they're moving around the back side well it's raised a whole lot of other questions because we said well take the region 14 and a half days about to rotate around half of the disc so if you pick the region up over the back side and you were watching it and you could monitor it as it was coming around and it was showing activity incredible value operationally because you're days out, a week out, before it's going to pop into view and pose a problem. And so simply by gaining that extra situational around, awareness around the back side, you might be able to do better at forecasting what's going to happen when it comes on the front. So there was a program, and this was pitched a while back. Unfortunately, it was, it was dropped. It was Solar Sentinel. I think it was in collaboration. I want to say with Ethan, but I'm not sure. Where they were going to put four satellites at different locations around the around the sun, um, it would have been very useful. But cost has gone up. There was another. Yeah. Um, just quick one. Is there is there common glass factors that behaves traveling from the sun? We may have common. Uh, like a general, it, it, can you assume that? Relativistic. They're relativistic, but I mean, it depends on, I mean, whether you're 10 MeV or 100 MeV, changes the little bit of right? But they are, they're, re they're relativistic, um, they're not extreme relativistic, but they're relativistic. I forget the exact number of 10 MeV, 100 MeV. Yeah. But they are, yeah, they're, they're definitely, it has to be taken into account. Well, that's it, and let's thank our speaker. And uh, I guess I'll see you guys next week. Uh, speaker is going to be Tom Patton here, so please be here.